I know you've cool. got a lot to get through. Uh, yeah. This is the second talk of our ADM talk. So for people who have just seen the soft rollout of the American development model, we've taken the US OPC guidelines, created rowing versions, specific examples for coaches to take their principles and put them into action and a few other adjustments that we've made uh, to the model along the way. So uh, Manny is the original author of the stage two guide, which was something that as we were starting the writing process of it was like, wow, this is an awesome compendium of resources, games, sample practice plans, the whole development picture for the stage two, uh, 10 to 10 to 12 or 10 to 13 middle school program, as well as what we folded into for the community or recreational junior high school program. So awesome to have Manny here to talk us through the details of building a middle school program and uh, making a great experience for stage two rowers. Manny, take it away. Cool. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know there's some awesome presentations, specifically in this time slot, and you chose to come to mind, uh, and I appreciate that. We're going to get right into it. The Zoom presentations are, I'm still not used to them, so by all means, if you have questions, uh, ask, and, and we'll, we'll get them through the, the uh, we'll, we'll moderate them, but this is about you coming here and making sure that your questions are answered. This is not about me rambling. This is about making sure that you learn and you get what you want out of this. All right, so today's about uh, middle school rowing, right? Uh, a little bit about me, and I, I won't go too much, but this is my fourth year, uh, 14th year coaching, and you kind of see my, my path there. Uh, and I was the head middle school coach at uh, Saratoga Rowing Association from 2017 to, to 2021. Uh, and prior to that, I was the program director at Sagamore Rowing in Long Island. Uh, and when I first got there, we had eight middle schoolers, and we had, when we left, we had uh, 43 uh, in, in about two years. So we, that's something I, I, 18 months, two years, that, that's something I'm really proud, proud of, uh, just getting the, the middle school experience up. Uh, and I'm passionate about middle school because I have my own traumatic middle school experiences. Uh, I, I remember coaches saying awful things to me. And if you're, if, if I'm going to say something offensive in the next, you know, the, the words that come out of my mouth, but I remember being, if you've come to my presentation, you've heard the story before, so you know, it's coming, but I was in sixth grade. Uh, my parents had just gotten divorced, but I knew how to play baseball. So I was really excited. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back to playing baseball. I got really good at this. My first year was my second year playing baseball. And I was really nervous, new friends, new environment. And I dropped the ball and the coach goes, if you didn't catch like a faggot, we would have had him out. Uh, and that was the last time I played baseball. So I talk, you know, middle school, uh, I'm, I'm 36 and I remember it like it was yesterday. You're going to remember that forever. So when you're coaching middle schoolers, how you make them feel determines, determines whether or not they do the sport. Uh, and winning and losing has a little bit to do with that because when you win, you feel good. And when you lose, you, you feel less good. But uh, that is only a small fraction of the experience that they're going to have uh on your team so so setting that experience is so important uh oh that was you there it is oh uh, so i just want to make sure that you 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 know you take pride in 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 what you're doing you're just not just a middle school coach you have a huge responsibility in setting the the the, the scene for for the rest of their you know athletic career right uh today uh, I am going to introduce the old uh, long-term athlete development model. It's important to see how we've developed what what we what was working and now how we've made it better and uh, improved. Share what I used at SRA, uh, and then go over practice plans and formulas and 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 how how you could incorporate some things. I do want to make sure I end five ten minutes early. Questions and we can go back and forth. Oh, oh, now I'm just going backwards. Here we go. So this is the old one, right? Where act to start fundamentals, uh, learn to train. And then this middle school was trained to train, train to compete. Uh, when you were learning, you're training for the fun of training and you're training with a chance to, to, to race. And then as you move into varsity and you, you move out of, into to college and you move into to post-grad training to win and then active for life. This was, uh, this is what our new ADM, the American development model was, is, is, evolved from right so it's kind of important to know where we're starting from right and the train to train uh was mostly just to get 
keep athletes moving, uh, but stop them before they felt fatigued, right? Building up their ability, how long they could play before they felt fatigued, right? And these are the type of workouts that we would do. Uh, you'll hear me talk a lot. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse, but perceived rate of exertion. We'll use that a lot with our mods. Like, uh, how hard should I go today? Scale of one to 10, yeah, two to four. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about the smiley faces that you see in the doctor's office. Uh, how much does it hurt? Zero to 10, we'll use a lot of smiley faces. Um, one thing you can do with middle school is, all right, we're looking at a stick. Show me your stick face. And then they'll, 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 they'll give different variations of what a stick looks like and what a 10 looks like. So it, it's fun. Uh, and then, uh, so this is our pre-puberty, right? And then sometime between, usually in the summer, because they'll leave one height and they'll come back another height, they, they come back kind of in puberty, right? And we, we attempt to increase their, their bases, right? And then the workouts become a little more challenging, a little more difficult. Uh, but, and we add these medium type workouts during puberty. And then post puberty, right? Uh, Post puberty is like your your traditional training plan, right? They, they've they've gone through puberty. They're now on the varsity. They're now competing, and that's your 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 traditional training plan. Uh, but I think it's important to note this uh, that post puberty is a it's separate stage. And I I was thinking about this presentation this morning and the concept of you can't make a caterpillar fly, right? Uh, a caterpillar will become a butterfly. But when it's a caterpillar, it's a caterpillar. And if you, if you throw it in the air, it's not gonna fly, right? A middle schooler is not a varsity athlete. And you just can't throw it in the air expecting to be varsity. Uh, even the ones that are, that, are, that are bigger and stronger, but if they haven't gone through puberty, if they just happen to be bigger, but they haven't gone through, the, then there's, there's certain things that they're not gonna be able to do. Yet I, I love the idea of caterpillars can't fly, right? You gotta wait till they're a butterfly. All right, so it's important making sure that they're uh, the biggest, strongest, you know, that you're training them appropriately for the stage they are at, right? Uh, I think most of us can remember in third grade, you take the caterpillar, you put it in the jar, you put the leaves in the sticks, um, and it goes into its cocoon and becomes the butterfly, right? If you don't put those leaves in the sticks in the jar, then the caterpillar dies, right? It is our job as the coaches to put the sticks and the, the leaves in the jar, and let the, the athletes follow their own process, right? But we, we can't speed up the process. We can just make sure the environment that they are in is set so that they can excel at their own rate, right? Uh, here's a couple stages and goals of adolescent development, right? Kind of this 11 to 12 year old. And, uh, again, ages are tough because everyone is really big enough that the growth uh, going through puberty. Uh, the boys and the girls are gonna go through at different times. Um, but also recognizing that when you're coaching middle school, you can't be like the two kids are best friends and that's why they're there. Like, oh, you're in puberty. You go in this group. You're not in puberty. You go in this group. And now the two kids are hang out together. They don't get to hang out. And then they really, this is lame. I'm going to go find something else. So it's definitely a, a challenging uh, job to balance all these things. And, and there's what we write in paper. There's what we do in, in, in kind of and textbook and research and you know, and then there's the kind of the application of real life when you're going through registration you set up si play you set up uh what's the other one uh regatta central you're not going to set up like kids going through puberty classes monday wednesday friday you're going to say seventh grade you're going to say the boys girls uh so there's recognizing the the application of it and then us as coaches having to have the skill set to be flexible and be ready to adjust appropriately. Uh, in this 11 to, to 14 year old athletic formation, lots of exercises focusing on the fundamentals, right? Focus on rowing well and general general strength and having fun. You know, some having so much fun that they want to come back, right? And then as they move into to older, they're 15 to 18 years old, you know, increasing the, the training demand, uh, going from a teacher to a trainer. Uh, increasing the volume and really trying to lock in on wrong uh, specific stuff. Any questions so far or should we keep cruising? No, it's doing great. I love, I love the caterpillar uh, analogy. Uh, the only thing is yeah. I, I'm not sure if you're, if your thumb or a paper or something is hitting the mic. 
uh, but your audio volume is kind of going up and down. So wherever it's set up. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully this works. Yeah, that's great. All right. So our five areas of athlete development, these are the areas we kind of want to hone in on is our stamina, uh, our ability to do an activity for a long time uh, and increase that time, our speed, our ability to move from here to there uh, quickly, uh, our strength, our ability to to pick up weight and move it, uh, and the amount of weight that we move, our skill, our ability to row and row well, and our suppleness or our flexibility, you know, hitting all five of those is how you develop a holistic athlete, right? And we'll talk about those. And as we go through the practice plans over the course of the week, we make sure we hit all five of those. And then I think this is just as important as the, the slide right before it, you know, so this is, a, these are the first five. I think these five are just as important, right? Uh, leadership development, the, you know, all these, these students, their they're, they're followers, their followers, their followers, they graduate or they become seniors. Like, all right, you're in charge now. What do you mean I'm in charge now? I haven't been in charge once for the six years I've been in this boathouse. Now I'm in charge. And then when they fail, we're like, we're shocked. Like, well, we haven't taught them how to lead, right? We don't throw a novice in the boat and be like, bro. And we're like, when they flip, you're like, who saw that coming? Right. Uh, our body awareness uh, in coaching middle school boys. I spent so much time on body awareness. When you say move your left arm and their right knee twitches, right? The kind of what they're doing, uh, having education on nutrition, knowing how to eat well, knowing, uh, taking ownership of the nutrition and, you know, some things are out of their control, you know, when their parents serve dinner, that's what they get. It's not really, you know, but what the, the choice they make at lunch, the choices they make for snacks, the choices they make for breakfast, you know, they're sitting there with the, um, the frosted flakes or, or, or some fruit and some proteins. And then they're like, ah, oh, I'll take the frosted flakes. Like you had a choice. Uh, our team building, you know, being a good teammate is a skill, right? Teaching them how to be good teammates, how to work together, uh, how to overcome mistakes and how to apologize for mistakes and how to have each other's back. Uh, and our mental skills training, our ability to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Right, recognizing there are going to be times in the sport of rowing and in life that they are unco- they are uncomfortable, and still staying focused on the task at hand. These auxiliary skills are just as important as, as the their their training skills. Uh, if you have a, a perfectly trained athlete who can't lead, can't control his body, is a bad teammate, can't eat, and can't focus, you know they're they're just as cooked uh, as as an athlete. You can do all these things, but it isn't isn't athletically developed. Uh, and these were, this is kind of our big three when I was at Saratoga Rowing Association, right? Uh, if we felt if we hit these three things that we would have, an, we would excel as a program. We knew we needed to recruit kids uh, and not just recruit, that's actually evolved since the, you know, I gave this presentation three years ago and now that is evolved, uh, recruit and retain and return. I kind of used those three. You got to get them in the boathouse you got to keep them in the boathouse. And then when they graduate, you want them to come back and be your coaches, right? So this recruit has, has evolved into recruiting, retaining, uh, and returning them to the boathouse, right? Developing athleticism. Uh, and that's not developing rowers. Different things. Athletes can be rowers. Rowers may not be able to be athletes, right? We want to develop athletes that can figure it out. You know, an athlete who will do a, uh, a relay race and figures out how to win could be the same athlete who was down by a seat and figures out how to win right and developing teachers uh, a lot of times a lot of people have problems finding coaches and then when they have coaches how do they build them up and i always think we're not develop, developing coaches at this level we're developing teachers right uh, so we'll hit on all three of these uh throughout the course of the presentation <clears throat> so let's talk about recruiting kids i love learn to row Learn to row is one of my favorite experiences as a coach because it, it's you get these. I don't want to call them easy wins. You work really hard for them, but uh, the kids have they go from nothing to racing in such a short period of time, and they figure stuff out on their own, and they build all this confidence. Uh, and just seeing them find their sport is an amazing feeling, right? Uh, and you can do things 
that to make athletes find their sport quicker, better, more effectively. So I'll talk a lot about the Learn to Row experience. And I know Abby Albright's here. I handed over Learn to Row from me to her. Uh, and she's taken and she's made it even better because I even admitted to her. I, I personally struggle with the fun part. Uh, I'm just, as I've gotten older and crankier, I was like, oh. But finding someone with a ton of energy who, who has great ideas is awesome. So when you're filling your learn to roll position, your coaching positions, right? Don't skimp on your coaching positions. And these are kind of the five positions I think are important. Uh, you got to find two coaches that connect with the guys and the girls, right? Um, we, we always have returning uh, athletes come back uh, or at SRA, we had the, the junior coaches that are high school volunteers. And then if someone had been volunteering for enough years, and when they graduated high school and they were back in the summer from college, we hired them on as coaches, right? But a lot of times the, uh, the full-time coaches are running around doing stuff, you know, doing sign-in, checking paperwork, check, making sure kids are registered, making sure lunches are working, fixing boats. And you need someone there whose sole responsibility is to talk with the kids, right? And that's where these two positions come in really, uh, are really important, uh, I think finding someone who connects with quiet kids is huge, right? A lot of times, uh, junior coaches, uh, kids back from college are, are really extroverted. They're really loud. They're really exciting. And then uh, the quiet kid who is doing learn to row doesn't see themselves in the coaches like this may not be for me. And we all know that you don't have to be extroverted to be in the sport, but extrovert, uh, extroversion tends to bring back those, uh, those athletes as coaches. Right. So we, we, the kids need to see themselves in the coaches. So we always made a, an effort to have a coach who is more reserved and more quiet and wouldn't mind, doesn't need to be the center of attention, doesn't mind having a one on one conversation on the side, doesn't mind, you know, talking with the kids and not being uh, in the middle. That was, that was huge. And we found a lot more of those kids coming back because they saw themselves in the coaches. Uh, we always wanted one person that was good with connecting with parents, right? We wanted them to have a, a professionalism about themselves because we'll do a sign-in sheet. I'll talk about the sign-in sheet in a minute, but we, we make all the, the students sign in when they, they arrive and we make their parents sign them in. Uh, and then that person who's communicating information uh, has, to, has to put the parent's mind at ease, right? When they're, they're going to make a judgment right or wrong based on the person who's doing the sign-in sheet, right? Uh, and if the person doing the sign-in sheet is not paying attention, is not, has their headphones in, doesn't really communicate well with the parents, it doesn't put the parents at ease. But we put someone specifically there who could, uh, whose sole job was to answer questions for the parents because the questions have tons of parents, uh, the parents have tons of questions. And when they get all their questions answered, like, oh, this group has everything under control and it puts them at ease so we thought that was uh critical and then we need one person that organizes everything right there's a lot of moving parts and you gotta especially if you choose to do uh, have junior coaches you have 15 high school volunteers you've got a couple coaches you've got equipment you've got launch you need someone who isn't uh involved in the minutia isn't involved in the, the small stuff which is hard to uh, hard to give away because that's where the fun part is like when you're playing with the when you're warming up with the kids and you're playing some fun warm-up game you the person organizing everything can't be there because then they can't see the big picture All right so those are the critical roles we talk about as learn to row uh the sign-in sheet i found is huge right so uh, when i was running learn to rows i made every parent come and sign their child in they didn't have to do it there's no law that required them to do it but we wanted the parents to get out of the car and we wanted them to talk to a coach. And then that coach can introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Manny. Hey, I'm Nick. Hey, I'm Abby. It's a pleasure to meet you. Your kid's doing great. Do you have any questions? Uh, and then we would talk about things that are coming up. Uh, we talk about the head of the goldfish, which is on the next slide. It's our end of learn to row race. Uh, hey, do you, can you come next Friday to this race? Uh, does your, you know, your kid's re doing really well at the sport. And then eventually the last your question, how do I sign my kid up again, right? Instead of getting lost in the internet and hoping an email gets answered, you could answer it right then and there. 
Uh, so that is the part that we make them get out of the car and talk to someone on that. That one-on-one -on -one connection makes a big difference. And then this, this part at the bottom, don't talk, encourage questions. Uh, when I'm coaching learn to row <clears throat> and I take it out a, a double, stroke seat, just row. What do you mean just row? Or actually what I'll do is I'll do a quiet demonstration on land first, right? I'll tell them, I'm going to show you how to row. If you don't care, that's cool. If you do care, that's cool. I'm going to row in this single, take note of what I do, and then try and do it when we go out. So I'll row in a rec single, and then we go on a double. I'll say, stroke seat, just do what I tried to do. And they'll do it. They'll row for 20 strokes, and then bow seat will row for 20 strokes. We go back and forth. Uh, and I don't say anything. And one of three things will happen. The rowers will figure it out by themselves, right? They, they, they're getting caught on their shirt, so they, they change their shirt. They, move, they adjust their shirt. Uh, so they don't get caught anymore. Uh, or they, they're, you know, their blades are backwards and, the, you know, they'll, fi they'll, they'll figure something out. They don't care, right? Their parents drop them off because they want them out of the house. They don't want to be there, right? So nothing you say matters because they don't care, right? Cool. Or they'll ask a question, which is awesome. Hey, coach, why does my, why does my handle get stuck here? I'm rolling along. My handle gets stuck here. What am I doing? Cool. Can I help you? Yes, please. And now you can coach. Now you have their attention, right? But if you come right off the bat, hey, you're doing this wrong. Hey, you're doing this wrong. Hey, you're doing this wrong. Like, I don't want to do this. When I play on my phone, I'm right constantly. I get points. I play, I play uh, Candy Crush. I play some game. I, I hit a couple buttons. And I get points. I'm a winner when I play Candy Crush. I come here. I'm bad at this. I'm bad at that. I'm bad at the other thing. I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, so it's important that we find as many positive things as we can. Right. And our points have to be more awesome than the points they're getting off their cell phone. Right. So th those three, I go with that. They figure it out when they do figure it out. I let them know, Hey, you made a change. You feel the difference. Yeah. What difference do you feel? Well, I was getting stuck here, but then I noticed I come from here to here. And then when I went back out that way, I didn't get stuck. Cool. Do you know what that's called? I don't. We call that a finish turn. You made a better finish turn. Oh, cool. Should I keep making a finish turn? Yes, you should. And they keep going, right? The kid who doesn't care until they figure until they figure out whether or not they like the sport, they still won't care. So just be patient. Or they'll ask a question, why do we get stuck? And they're allowing you to coach. I love that idea of just wait. And as coaches, we're like, I want to fix this. I want to fix that. It's not about us. It's about them. Uh, any questions so far? Anything pop up? No, those are great tips, and I imagine people are just busy taking notes. But if anybody does have a question, Manny's happy to take them as we go. So put it in the Q and A. Uh, that's easier to manage than the chat. Otherwise, keep on dropping knowledge, Manny. All right, cool. Thank you. Doing it right on time, right? All right. Other ways to recruit uh, kids to your your program, right? Uh, health and wellness fairs. Anything in, in in town that you can be at. Any sort of fair. Uh, but it's not just going to these things. It's going to be engaging, right? Uh, go out and be awesome, right? Go out. If you're excited about the sport, allow your excitement to come through. Uh, don't be, again, we're competing with all these different things to get people's attentions, include not only other teams and other sports, uh, you know, basketball, soccer, lacrosse, you know, this, that, the other thing, uh, but are the cell phones and the computers and there's other ways that kids are going to be engaged. We have to be engaging. Right. Uh, so, so if you love the sport and if you're coaching middle school, there's almost a hundred percent chance you do because it takes a special person to coach learn to row and, and coach middle school. All right. Let that, per, let that personality come through. Uh, and I always take down their info. Don't let them leave without saying, Oh, I'll figure it out. I'll Google it. Cause they never do take their information, call them up, be like, Hey, this is so-and-so. I met you at the health and wellness fair. Uh, I just wanted to see if you had any questions. We'd love to, you know, love to get you rowing this summer or this winter or this spring, whenever. Uh, middle school takeover. So that was something we did uh, at SRA. Uh, in our first year, we just did it with the sixth grade boys and girls, the seventh grade uh, girls, and the eighth grade girls. And that was in 2018. And then by 2020, uh, we had evolved to two high schools and like four middle school or excuse me, two middle schools and four elementary schools, right? Where we bring ergs to elementary schools. 
uh, and we would take over the phys ed programs. We were a unit. There's a basketball unit. There's a soccer unit. Now there was a rowing unit. We'd rent a U-Haul. We'd bring all these ergs, and we would be there with the teachers working together. Uh, and the, in, the, in that file of level two stuff, there are lesson plans for middle school takeovers. Uh, and I'm happy to share and talk about different ways to do it. But the three things that, you, that don't get communicated as, as well or as important as they should be is you have to be fun, right? When you go in there, you have to be fun. You have to be exciting. Uh, you have to be energetic, which is number two. Uh, you can't be flat, right? And I always put the last one, don't sell anything. Just go in there and teach rowing, right? If you go in there and you're trying to sell your club, right it'll it'll it will it'll rub the teachers the wrong way right and they won't invite you back but if you get the teachers on your side then they'll do all the selling for you and we had five six teachers at the at the middle school that are were always emailing me hey man i got this kid uh you know five seventh grade boy five eleven i think it'd be awesome uh doesn't does he can't catch a ball doesn't doesn't play a sport I think he'd be a great rower. Can I send him to you? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, but the teachers were doing that for us. But if you go in guns blazing, trying to sell your stuff and be like a, like a, a sleazy, it, it, you'll undermine your credibility with uh, the teachers. The teachers are your friends. You got a whole lot of them. So just go in there, make sure you're fun, make sure you're energetic, make sure they learn something. Right. And then the teachers will help you out. Uh -huh. And then another thing we did at SRA was bring a friend day. Uh, hey, you got a friend, bring him, bring him to, bring him to practice. They can come in winter, whenever. Right, spring is a little tougher because you're trying to race and on the water a little more challenging. But in the in the, in the winter, you got a friend. As long as they're safe and they're having fun, bring them in. You know, we got to sign the waiver and we got to make sure the parents know they're there. They just can't randomly show up and be like, hey, uh, so and so jumped in the bus and came to practice today. Does so and so's parents or family know they're here? No, they're at home frantically looking for them. Be aware of that. But for the most part, as long as you're doing it responsibly, make sure they're having say, they're safe, they're having fun, get them, to, get them to practice and let them see that rowing and working hard can be fun. Uh, question? Chat? Nope, doing good. Oh, cool. Recruiting kids. So the, the secret is fun. And I want to share some of these because they don't, they don't justify kind of how the, the intensity of fun. So I'm going to share my screen. I should have pulled these up already. Let's see. So these are different games we use to work on agility and work on, uh, on different aspects of, of the sport. Uh, this first one's called Huddle Tag. It is for quickness and, and, and speed and a little bit of teamwork and a lot of laughter. And we're gonna definitely share the sounds. Share this. We're still on your slides, by the way. Oh, there we go, got it. Cool. And I'll let this down. Internet, go. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> so uh, huddle tag, they, they make a circle. This person on the outside uh, is the tagger. And then one of the people in the circle is the one they have to tag. And it's the circle's job to work together to make sure they don't get tagged. I love that game and you can just hear the laughter in the background, right? This one is a uh, minefield. Again, this one, we set up this, 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 this playing field. Uh, these people out in the field have to keep their eyes closed uh, and they have to get from one side of the gym to the other, pick up a cone and come back uh, while listening to their teammates. The only ones that their teammates have to give them feedback uh, but their eyes have to be closed. If they run into anything, they have to start over again. Whoa! Whoa! 
Blue. Blue. And I love this one because afterwards we were talking uh, about uh, things that they learned. And they're like, when someone else is talking, it's really hard for people to listen to me. And all the coaches threw their hands up and they were like, tell us more about that. Tell us more about that. Uh, we got a couple question and answer. Hey, I'm trying to listen. Yeah, that one's from Jessica that, that asks uh, how, how to basically expand the middle school program to transfer to the high school program and how you how you manage those oh uh where did she put it where where is it uh it's in the chat not the there's there's chat. there's a different one Jessica. in the chat than the q a yeah i'll i'll feed yeah. these okay. to you as we go uh, okay. but that's like if you have a rowing program that has both a middle school and a high school program you're competing with other middle school programs how do you how do you help get kids in your middle school program and and hold on to them through high school yeah so uh Couple things. How do I get rid of this? Live answer. I have no idea how to make this go away. So now I'm the old. There it is. I'm the <laughs> old guy who can't work the computer. Uh. So a couple of things. That's why the fun part is so important because they will always find something that's more fun. Uh. So if we're not the place as we're competing, uh. It, it, that is a a constantly on the front of our mind like there's there's other things that is pulling them in uh so we have to be fun we have to be accessible so um and a lot of things were already in place before i arrived in in, in 2017 you know the uh sra provides a bus from the middle school to practice you know eliminating a barrier uh sra has a, a road assistance program where they were you know, could help cover costs that was that reduced a barrier but a lot of the school sports have very little barriers. There's no cost, you, you know, it's right there at the school. So try to eliminate as many barriers as possible. Uh, and then there's a connection between the seventh and eighth graders are really important. Become the, then they become the eighth and ninth graders. And then, so they've all worked together for a year as seventh and eighth graders. And then they go, they're eighth and ninth graders. And in the summer, those two groups will work together, right? So, and they're not these, these, these looming ninth graders that are in the high school. They're the kids they knew a year before. So they're already connected to those kids. And then when they graduate eighth grade and they're going into ninth grade, right? There's just a connection. It's not as daunting because they've seen their buddies do it. And I think that makes a big difference. The scarier jump is from ninth to 10th. Uh, Cause then it's, you're not, uh, especially the scholastic model where there's freshman and then there's junior, right? You've got your freshman group and there's no jump to junior. Then, then all of a sudden you go from the best of the freshmen to possibly the worst of the varsity. And that's a big jump. But from middle school to high school, I think if there's seventh, eighth, ninth overlap, it helps link them. Uh, uh, Jessica, I'm sorry. I just reread your question. I saw that you, you have a high school rowing program and a middle school in the system, but no middle school rowing program. So it sounds like Man Manny's idea there about starting to pair kids up. Uh, Manny, other other ideas about kind of recruiting recruiting down without necessarily having a dedicated middle school program. Yeah, and the other thing I would I would say there. So when I was at Sagamore, when we first started, there were four coaches, forty three kids, and eight of them were mods. Eight of them were middle schoolers. Uh, we made our big announcement as a group, you know, here are the things you need to know. Here's registration, here's race stuff, you know, generic administrative stuff. And then we break up into our, our boats, like, Hey, you're taking the one V you're taking the women, you're taking the two V blah, blah, blah. And then one coach always took the mods. So he, you know, the varsity coach would mix with each other. Everyone take a little bit of everyone. Uh, but the mod coach always took the same mods. So they were part of the team but they also trained separately and had their own coach uh, and had their own training program amongst this bigger varsity program. Uh, and that's kind of how, how I would build my middle school program is not necessarily have a middle school team, but have them as part of the group and then set them, you know, 
set them aside. And when we did winter training, the middle schoolers came erg three days a week and the varsity erg six, six days a week. And the mods only came on station day. So we'd have like station, like Tuesday, Thursdays were stations, you know, and the mods were one of the groups of many groups. And then their station was just always pared down. So if the varsity was doing 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off for 10 minutes, and then moving to the next station, the mods would get there and do 20 seconds on, 40 seconds off. And we were able to modify for the mods without ruining the varsity's workout. And then the varsity specific ones, like I would never, we had a workout uh, six times, three minutes. I would never have the mods do that, but I only scheduled those on the days it was varsity only. And that's how I'd make the schedule. And I have that. Uh, whoever asked the question, just email me. I'll find all the scheduling notes I have. I Somewhere in my Google Drive, I still have them happy to share them. But things like that, if the, if the varsity and doing station work was, uh, the varsity was doing station work uh, and one was just 10 minutes steady, then when the mods got there, it was 10 minutes of drills. And we made sure that they just, it was pared down for the mod and that way they had a workout that was appropriate and they uh, were still with their buddies. One more question came in uh, via the Q and a, have you had any trouble with middle schools discouraging you from coming to the school to promote a non-school sport? So if the, yeah. if the school doesn't want to share their athletes. Yes. So we got into this, our, our club president at the time, had done a fundraiser with the athletic director. And that's how we got into Saratoga Rungs, or into Saratoga school districts. And then once I developed a good relationship with those phys ed teachers, they did all the work for me. They, the, they called their peers and were like, hey, they'll come, it's free and they're great, take them. And that's how we got into the other middle schools, not because I made the phone calls, but because they were calling us. And I, I, I said, hey, do you know, I asked it once I had a good relationship with the teachers. Hey, do you know anyone else would be interested in this? Oh, yeah, my, my buddies over at Schuylerville, they love this. I did my, one of our teachers in Saratoga did her student teaching for the teacher in Schuylerville. So I was like, hey, do you know anyone? She's like, Schuylerville would love this. I'll call her. And that afternoon, I had an email from Schuylerville that said, hey, the teacher told me about this. We'd love for you to come out. And that's how we got around that was ha not burning the bridge with the phys ed teachers. The first one was really hard. Getting in was really hard. Uh, but once we got in, they did the work for us. Sure. Well, thanks. Keep it going. We got 20 more minutes. All right. I can do this. Uh, I got one more fun game I want to show. Uh, this one. So this one, they don't even know they're squatting. This is called turtle tag. You can't get tagged if you're in your shell. Over the course of that game, they must have done 50 squats. And if you tried to do 50 squats, it would have been a riot. But we played turtle tag, and they're like, oh, this is amazing. So, so that's another fun one. There's two more on the slides. And if you, if you click on them on the, on the PowerPoint that's on the schedule, you should be able to see them. Uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, Great. we're good. All right, here we go. Uh, developing athleticism. So I understand the print is, not the, is pretty small here, right? So I just included it on the back. Uh, at the end of this this slide, bigger, right? So don't squint to see this at the, at the very end. But on the water, uh, four to five practices a week, 90-minute uh, practice, that's drop off the pickup, which is tough. And at some point, I think we made that well, 105 minutes, uh, an hour 45, because uh, we don't want parents resenting us for waiting in the parking lot, right? So that was something we talked a ton about. Uh, on land, we hit agility, body strength, and speed. Uh, we only had one technical uh, point of emphasis for the week. So like everyone's working on finish turns, whether you're an eighth grade girl or a seventh grade boy, everyone's working on finish turns. Uh, we did a lot of stretching, a lot of skills and drills, uh, one drills workout, one peak power workout, and then kind of one race workout. All right. And this is how we broke it up over the course of the, the week. Uh, we used our land day uh, to help take stress off the equipment. 
So everyone's day one wasn't always the same day one. I want to say all the boys were doing land on, on Mondays while the girls were on the water. But then Tuesdays, you know, the eighth grade girls were on land. Uh, the seventh grade girls were on the water. The, uh, the boys are on the water. So for the boys, it's their day one. For the seventh grade girls, it's day two. For the eighth grade girls, it's their land day. So we had to be pretty creative. Instead of going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, first day, second day, third day, uh, et cetera. And then we had notes here about things that we wanted to work on with the coaches and, and uh, points of emphasis for the coxswains. We didn't want to forget about them as, uh, as well. And then this is uh, for uh, being on land, right? Our winter training formula, 20 minutes of flexibility. So it's 10 at the beginning, 10 at the end. Uh, two sprint workouts, whether it's landing on, uh, by land, everything's on land, but uh, running uh, or erging. Uh, two strength workouts with body weight and core. Uh, two stamina workouts with running and erging. So there's only, you know, those two erg workouts. Some plyometrics, some my hand coordination, some yoga. Again, all in the form of, of game stuff. We did a lot of tennis ball. Uh, Instagram's great. And if you use it correctly, you, you, you use the hashtag, uh, you know, speed workout and you'll get a bunch of games to play. And we play all these different tennis ball games uh, for jump rope, for kind of plyometrics, jump roping. And one of the videos I didn't show was they had to make a jump rope routine and then compete with the other uh, squads in their jump rope routines. Right, so now they don't even think that they're doing plyometrics; they're just competing in a in a better dance off, uh, which is fun. All right, a couple questions came through. Uh, not questions, chat. I'll get back to that. I promise. But I want to make sure I have uh, go through everything. So, Jessica, I'm not ignoring you. I just want to keep moving. Train teachers. So this one, this one's a big one, right? So this first one, uh, head coach and administrator. If you're a head coach, or administrator. Here's my here's the things I would I would tell you right, is you got to build leaders. Uh, middle school uh, rowing is unpredictable and they can't be so rigid. They don't know how to read and react. They got to know how to figure it out and then you have to build those skills up, right? Uh, I'll never forget a, a coach called me, hey, Manny. I was like, what's wrong? He goes, nothing's wrong, but I said, what happened? He goes, well, this middle school, this learn to row quad was doing really good. I said, how good? They're, they're, they're learn to row. He goes, well, we were rowing with the tailwinds and we were moving along and we turned around and now we can't row against the headwind anymore because if we go by threes, they can't row. If we go by twos, they're not strong enough. All right. So he knew he was in trouble. He knew he had to keep them safe. Uh, and we got him out. It was a disaster. But we, we, see, we kept everyone safe, but he knew to 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 lead in that situation keep everyone calm uh for middle school rowing i if you i know there's a coach shortage i would try and find teachers and teach them rowing then instead of trying to find rowers and teach them uh how to be teachers don't find rowers and make them teachers find teachers and teach them rowing right there's always a phys ed teacher whom i want to help there's always a um a teacher who wants to get involved who doesn't learn to row uh who is connected to the sport somehow, uh, and you can teach them rowing. When we were at Sagamore, we, we found teachers and were like, here, do our learn to row for the summer and then come teach our middle school. And it was awesome because they knew how to manage the group. They weren't intimidated by 50 kids. Like that part's a piece of cake, right? And then once we taught them, you know, the oars going this way, they face this way, let them figure it out. They're like, done. But they knew how, and they knew how to make everything fun, right? Uh, we give them a framework. Uh, they got practice plans and, and uh, we gave them a safety net, you know, make sure the kids are having fun, make sure they're enjoying themselves. Uh, these are the objectives you want to hit, but otherwise like kind of be yourself and, and, and coach. So we gave them some free, we, we set up a box and it says, as long as you stay within this box, cool, have some fun. Uh, and then give them your time. Uh, if you're an administrator, you're a head coach, you can give a middle school coach some time. Uh, that is the, one of the most valuable things you can give them uh, is just being a listening ear and helping, right? For our younger coaches, right, our, our developing coaches, uh, ask as many questions as you can. Uh, I wished I asked more questions when I was a young coach, uh, but I insisted that I already knew everything. Uh, and then about seven years in, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so ask questions, have a practice plan, 
right? Don't freestyle your practice, have a plan, right? And again, uh, it doesn't have to be a minute to minute, but you should have three drills and a workout that you want to get done that day, right? Uh, let your personality shine. The, the, the kids want to know you. They come back because they know you and they, they like you and, and don't be afraid to talk with them and learn about them and share about your own experiences. Uh, ride along. If you can ride in lunches, do it, right? If you can ask questions, do it. Uh, but with varsity coaches, uh, stay in the moment, right? So a lot of times you go out with this practice plan, I need to do A, B, and C. And something awesome happens that could be a great teachable moment. You're like, no, I'm going to ignore that because I have to get A, B, and C. We've got a middle school race coming up this weekend. Forget the middle school race. Do it, Have a teachable moment, right? Take advantage of that. Who, who cares, right? So, so the kids care and you want them to be prepared for their race. But if you have something that could be a light bulb moment that could set these kids off for the rest of their career, you know, and that, that's, that's at any level. That's not a level two, level one, level five. At any point, I had a kid this season, right? So now I'm in Skidmore. A kid goes, he, he PRs on his piece. He goes, this is nuts. I said, what's nuts? He goes, when you train five days a week, you get faster. And he didn't say it to be a jerk. He like genuinely meant it. I was like, you're right. I'm glad you figured that out. He's like, this is awesome. But th there's nothing more important than, than that teachable moment, right? Uh, and then for the, the young coaches, find a skill that makes you sustainable, right? So I've always wanted to work with varsity. I've always wanted to work with the elites. I want to I wanna make boats go really fast. A lot of young coaches want to make boats go really fast. Uh, but also a lot of times if you're in a club situation, uh, you have to pay bills, right? So for me, I was like, all right, I'm going to be really good at coaching middle school, right? Really good at learn to row. That's going to help me pay some bills, right? And that's going to allow me to coach varsity. For, for a young coach, you coach learn to row. If you could fix an engine, right? If you can do a website, if you can do all these other things that go into running a club, it helps make you more sustainable as, as a coach, right? So as you're developing your coaching skills, develop a thing that is also going to pay the bills. Questions? Cool. So we, we flew through that uh, and I'm happy to have discussions and I'll go back and if you have anything or I'll see what we had here. Yeah, we're in good shape time-wise. We answered Jessica's question already as we went, uh, but anybody else, uh, please use the Q&A to submit questions. And we've got about 10 more minutes on this session. <clears throat> Man, I have a question while, while things come in. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you could go back and do one thing differently, as, as a middle school coach, what, what, what would it be in your own experience? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Uh, I put my own, I'm not sure this is like the one, but it's the first one that comes to my head. Uh, I would put my own agendas aside going out to a practice especially as I developed as a coach, I was like, I, so I was coaching middle school and I was also assisting with Orion. And then I got to do a bunch of cool things there. And I grew as a coach. And then I went back to coach. I was still coaching middle school. It was like, I know this, I know this, I know this. And the truth is none of them care. The middle schoolers don't care, but I came in like, Oh, I, I've learned all this cool stuff. Don't you want to know? They're like, we don't, you know, but I had this agenda. And as you develop as a coach, you're like, oh, I've got these things that I'm learning. I'm a way better coach now than I was a year ago. Uh, but the truth is the middle school is just want to know about being fun and, and having fun and knowing you. And uh, I got so busy as my role grew. I spent less time with the kids. And that sucked because that's why you, that's the fun part. Because if you're doing all the middle school stuff, and not getting the benefit of it, like the, the funny joke, the, they say the funniest things. Uh, but if you're not getting all the, you're just getting the angry emails, but you're not getting the funny quotes, you're like, this is, this is brutal. Uh, and that's, I would find a way to kind of spend more time with the athletes uh, as my role grew. But that's a, that's a great question. I'm not sure what else I, I would tell a lot to younger Manny though. We would sit down, we'd have a beer, and younger Manny would get reamed a new one several times sure. over. And that's and that's that's the nature of it, right? Like yeah. none of us none of us start out perfect. So yeah. uh, learning process, and I always like hearing from people what what they think those things, what they think those yeah. things are. 
Uh, got a couple more coming in here. Um, one of the things you just kind of touched on, what do you do with the kids that are there because their parents are forcing them? So they're uninterested or maybe distracting the rest of the group because they don't actually want to be there. How do you, how do you manage that? Yeah. So that's always hard. Uh, I wish I had an answer that made it easier, but they like something. They may not like rowing, but there's something that they enjoy in, in life. And it's about connecting the two. Uh, and even if it's finding out what they are interested in and then talking with them before and after practice, like, hey, how's that thing you're working on? You know, they're really into Legos and they don't like rowing. And I'm just using that example. I'm really into this. Uh, cool. What are you into? When you're not wrong, what are you into? A, B, C. And a lot of times you'll find you or a co or another coach will already be interested in that. And then you're having a conversation. Forget rowing. You just have a conversation about that other thing. And now they're not there for rowing. They're there for you. And now they'll do whatever you say. And now you, that kind of builds your momentum. Uh, and the, 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 the 15, 20 minutes before practice and the 10 minutes after practice are so important for developing relationships. And then same thing with the kids, like what's going on? How's life? How's school? Uh, so for that kid who gets dropped off, there's something that they're into and it's about learning about it and connecting about it. And even if you don't know anything about it, what's that? Tell me about it. And if they're passionate about it, they'll just ramble. Oh, cool. Let me tell you about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and next thing you know, they're, they're ranting and they just take the last thing they say and just make it a question and get them to keep talking. All right. So they're, here's point A, here's point B, here's point C, here's point, and then you've gone somewhere else in your head a bazillion times and you come back and they're still talking about it. And then here's D, E, F. F, tell me more about F. Oh, F is this. And then they go and, and finding something that they're engaged about, that they're excited about. Uh, and building that relationship and they may that that i think is your best chance of getting them to buy in it seems like a theme whether it was the teachers or the athletes you start with the relationship first and then work from there right yeah everyone um i had a grad school professor ream that into us and he's like every person comes in here so this is x and o's and every person who comes in here is wrong it's about the relationship sounds like greg you're wrong and then here I am, four years later. Like Greg, Greg was right. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin asks, "What aspects of your middle school or learn to row background have you brought with you to college coaching?" Oh, the relationships, definitely that. Uh, making sure that I get that none of my stuff, all my practice starts at four thirty. All my stuff is done at four fifteen. Launches are set. Emails are done, and I'm just hanging out, talking with the, the team before practice i'm not running around with my head cut off i just talk with them uh and the fun part uh the college kids love dad jokes it's like the big hit uh and i'll spend time looking up dad jokes but nothing and then nothing being more important in the moment right that one kid saying when i train i'm having a good moment or one kid you know we're supposed to be working on x but why is it teachable moment and that's been really helpful nice uh, how do you encourage kids who only seem to put in effort or care when they're doing relays or something that's competing head to head, uh, but not during circuits or other training? I think that's fine. Right. So they're, they'll figure if they stick around long enough, they'll figure it out. And it's super frustrating for a coach to, to see potential in an athlete and see the athlete not getting the most out of their potential in that moment. Right. But also recognizing that they're there and they may not be putting in effort for a bazillion reasons other than not wanting to do effort. Right. So they're doing a relay and they go hard in relays. It's because they're good at relays. And if they're not throwing a bar around a ton, cause they're not good at the bar. Right. So they're not going to, they, they're trying to protect their ego. I think it's, 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 it's like psychology level stuff where, where as long as I don't go hundred percent of this, I can always be like, Oh, I, I was bad at this. Cause I had five, 10, 10 more percent. Uh, and a lot of them don't know. Like I, I just think about my own middle school experience and my own diet. Right. And why I couldn't focus. And for the longest part, I was addressing the focus. And the truth was it was my diet. 
And when I got to college and started eating better, my focus issues went away. So a kid, a kid who, who is, is not eating, you know, after school, what do you have for after school? I had a pop tart and you do the relays first and the, and the, the lifting second. Great. That pop tart burned off in the relay and now they're gassed and they have nothing left in it. It's not their fault. There's so many things. If they're there every day and they're showing effort in something, I would let the rest go. And that personally causes me an ulcer as a coach, but as like the, the big picture person, I know it's, it's, it's fine. But I also recognize it's also frustrating. And I need to like, let it go. They're here. They're laughing. They're doing the, they're doing something hard. There's a reason we just got to figure it out. So on that same topic of, of making paradigm shifts, uh, I've got a current varsity head coach who's now the new program director wants to change middle school from being very focused on being good at rowing to being more about athlete development and, and recruiting new kids. What, what do you suggest for kind of making that change? Uh, oh, this is not going to be a, a, we've only got three more minutes. So, <laughs> all right, this is not an easy answer, but I'm starting with the coaches and I don't know they could be here. Maybe they are, maybe they are. I don't know who asked it, but a lot of if the coaches, so if you're the program director and your coaches of varsity, you have to have complete trust in that person running the middle school. And if that person's going, yep, uh-huh, I got it, and doing whatever they want, right? And you're not there to see it, you're cooked. It, uh, it, the coach has got to be the, the coach who work with them on a day-to-day basis has to, has to buy into the new philosophy. And there may be a trade there. Hey, you take the varsity, you take this varsity boat out once a week. And, it's, you know, so, cause a lot of times they want to go fast, go fast, go fast. Great. Here's your chance to go fast with this, the three V this one practice, take the three V We make the three V coach to my coach for the day, right? You switch. But the, that kid who just wants to go for that coach just wants to go fast. There's someone who uh, I would start with the coach uh, for whatever reason that if that coach isn't buying in the whole program's cooked. I will say too, part of the reason we wanted to develop the ADM site, put your stage two guide front and center is to kind of give coaches, program directors, the ability to say, well, Hey, here's what the USOPC recommends. Here's what US rowing recommends. Getting really good at rowing is really not the appropriate focus or the best use of the time for a middle school program. So hopefully you could take from our ADM website and, uh, and, and pick up some resources and some kind of support for your position with making that change. Last question here. Uh, typically have smaller build middle school athletes who come out and how do you build up their confidence when it comes time to lift boats and, and compete against bigger teams? Oh, yeah, we're all, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And that's what I would tell them. The big kids are, the big kids are usually slow and awkward. The little kids are usually fast and nimble. Uh, they, they got to remember their strengths, right? Uh, and SRA, one of my favorite athletes, uh, of, of probably one of my top 10 of all time, was the absolute uh, smallest kid on the team, but she can make the, the quad go straight. And, and she rode lights out and she could row a single and she made her top middle school bow is now a coxswain. Uh, and, and she is an incredible athlete, but she was smaller and, and, and not as, uh, not, not as athletic as, as not as big, not as strong, but was still a great athlete. Uh, the, we all have a strength. It's finding that strength and, and highlighting that strength in that kid so that they know they have a strength, right? Cause they're just an eyeball. They're like, I'm the smallest one here yeah, but you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And, and build, they, the kids will always, and the coaches, they'll always find their weakness about finding our strength. One more, one more bonus question then, because this made me think of this, and then we got to be done. But uh, how do you fit the ERG into this age group? Because the ERG rewards strength, size, much more yeah. than maybe the boat does if you've got an athlete who can learn how to move a boat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when I was at SRA, and even now, it's even more, we did everything in watts. Uh, and then we measured improvement. So when we ranked the kids, we didn't rank them based on what they did. We ranked on how they got better. So we always did the same workout. We just changed the vent and the rate. But it was like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, vent at a 7, rate at a 20. Next week, it was 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, vent at a 6, rate at a 24 but they were knew the workout uh, and hopefully they were getting better. 
And then using Watts, we could see how much of a percentage they got better. And now that little kid got substantially better. He got 11% better. He still may be ranked last in raw Watts, but they got 11% better. We reward the process of getting better. Uh, and now that that big kid is, wants to do anything about it, they got to work harder because it's not about the Watts. They win the Watts just by being bigger. They want to win the, the, the reward. They got to win the process. Awesome. That's, that's teaching a lot of life lessons too. So that's, that's yes. great yes. advice. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, we've got the awards ceremony in 15 minutes uh, and then a lunch break. And then at 3 p.m., I'm on the ADM track talking about strength training for juniors and going through the ADM model strength training. And then we've got other talks this afternoon too. So check out the schedule and hope to see you on the other talks. Thanks so much for attending.